Faye. It could be the Lord's Make house tonight. Like oh, I like that song. Nothing good have I done I shall to deserve be. God's own son. I'm not worthy of the scars in his hand. Yet he chose the road to Calvary to die in my place. Listen, listen. Why he loved me, I can't understand. <laughs> Amen. Well, listen, we're here tonight to lift up the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I'm glad to be saved, glad to know my sins are forgiven, glad to know my name is written in God's reservation book, the Lamb's Book of Life. And there's not an eraser big enough. And there's not a decree of man powerful enough to take it out. Amen. God's good tonight. Well, it's Wednesday night. It's church. Now, we've been having church for a while. And, uh, boy, it's been good this week. Have you enjoyed it this week? Amen. Man, God's speaking to my heart. And I hope he's speaking to your heart. And the idea is that we get closer to him in the revival time that his people, God's people, the Christians, would get closer to him, that we would be encouraged and challenged to live right, to live uh, in, in service to the Lord, to keep on going. And boy, this singing and this preaching is just phenomenal. Well, I tell you, it is just good stuff. And uh, we're excited about it again tonight. And uh, if you'll pray, if you'll pray and say, Lord, speak to my heart. God, deal with me. God, help me to get closer to you. Well, I'll tell you, he'll do something for you. And uh, if you're visiting tonight for the first time, we're glad to have you. Met some visitors this, this evening. Glad to have you. Uh, stop out at the, uh, the visitor center if you didn't already uh, and get one of those little welcome packs. And you can fill out that card. You can drop it back off at the visitor center if you like. They'll give all those to me. You say, what are you going to do with that information? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to just send you a letter and uh, just thanking you for coming. And, and then, uh, you know, if you want, if you have questions, sometimes people have questions. And they want to know about the church. want to know about, hey, I heard something that preacher said, you know. Now, now this ain't the regular preacher around here. So, so if he says something, you know, I'll give you... I'll give you his number, and you can call him. <laughs> no, listen now. I have all the confidence in the world. Listen, these people, when we bring somebody behind this pulpit, we have confidence in them. Listen, I, I love this dear brother, and I, he's going to preach the book. And, uh, but anyhow, but sometimes people have questions. You know how it is. And uh, so we'd love to just be a help to you and to be an encouragement to you. And uh, if you don't respond, that's all, that's all right. We won't bug you. We won't sell you information. We're not like that. But, uh, but we do want you to know we appreciate you being here. Uh, we do have youth classes all this week. So right now, uh, there is an infant to toddler nursery that's going on right now. There's also a junior church that's going on right now, ages 5 to 12. And so uh, any of those uh, in that age group, uh, any time between now and the preaching, uh, you can get out and slip out there. Once the preaching starts, we lock those back doors and put big locks on them. And No, I'm just kidding. But listen, when the preaching starts, we want your hearts to be in tune with the word of God, I want you to just just focus in. Nothing else in the world. Silence them cell phones. Listen, if you're a brain surgeon, don't do it. Okay, put it on vibrate. But but if you um, if not, just just put it on silent so you can just focus in on what God would have for you tonight. I believe God's got something for everybody in this room tonight. Everybody in this room and those that are listening online, God's got something for us. And so, uh, before we get started, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, pray special for uh, Brother Paul Stumball. Uh, he was having some breathing problems, and he went back into the hospital. So I just got a message about that uh, today. And so keep Brother Paul uh, in your prayers and Miss Pat uh, in your prayers uh, at this time. And just asking God to, to bless and, and to, to do a work there. So let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, ask his blessing on the service tonight, and then we'll get into our first hymn. Father, we love you. We're thankful for the day that you give to us, and thank you for a wonderful opportunity to come to your house, to hear your word, or to hear singing that glorifies you and, and lifts our hearts to focus upon you. And God, I pray that you would be glorified in everything that's said and done here tonight. I pray that you would be with our young people tonight and the teachers that are in those youth classes and nursery. Lord, that you would help their little hearts and little minds, Lord, to be turned to you. Lord, so many ungodly things in this world, so many uh, lies and false uh, doctrines that are out there. God, help us to just give them your word, that precious Bible. And God, help us in this service tonight to hear from you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's grab a hymn book. Turn to page number 52, The Lily of the Valley. What a beautiful song. Page number 52. 
This time, we're going to have the Morrisons come all the way from Calhoun. Is it Calhoun, right? Calhoun, Georgia. And so, uh, is that where it is? Calhoun? Okay, I thought, I saw you look at her like, you look at her like, that ain't where we're from. I'm like, wait, that's where you're from. I know where you're from. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. So, uh, but anyhow, and then after they sing, uh, Pastor Jason McNeese is going to come from Bel Air, Maryland. He pastors the great Emerton Baptist Church there. His son's with him tonight. We're glad he can come and be with. He's got some other youngins at home. And, and, uh, and so anyhow, we're just glad that he could be with us this week. How many of you have never heard the Morrison sing? Let me see your hands. I know. Okay, a couple. How many of you never heard Pastor McNeese preach? How about like that? Anybody? Okay. He keeps raising his hand every night. I, I guess he's just waiting to hear a message. Amen. So we got about five or six that haven't heard you preach. And I hope and pray that you've been praying and asking God to speak to your heart. I want you to know this. And, and these, these evangelists, they'll be the first to tell you, listen, it's not, uh, it's not the singing and the preaching that they're coming that's going to bring the revival it, it's revival is not conjured up it's prayed down and and when you and me we have a desire to get closer to God that's where the reviving and the stirring in our hearts would go and so this music and this preaching just points our hearts back to Jesus Christ and so we're glad of that so God bless you hey brother you go go ahead and sing we're ready I want to uh, put out a uh, disclaimer this is about our 35th time singing this week so if we sing something we've already sung, I'm sorry, okay? Because we, we've lost count at this point. Set my feet on a sturdy rock Out of his great love I've learned the meaning of salvation Out of his great love I had gone astray I lost my way When I called upon his name Then he rescued me Now the song I sing Loving God is he Out of his great love He picked me up Set my feet on a sturdy rock Out of his great love I've learned the meaning of salvation Out of his great love Now I shout his praise through all my days For his endless mercy and grace There's no other one who has greater love With joy I will ever sing Out of his great love he picked me up Set my feet on a sturdy rock. 
walked out of his great love of the meaning of salvation out of his great love out of his great love he picked me up set my feet on a sturdy rock out of his great love of the meaning of salvation out of his great love out of his great love he picked me up Set my feet on a sturdy rock out of his great love and learn the meaning of salvation out of his great love. Salvation out of his great love. Aren't you glad he loves us? Amen. This song here is the title cut on our new, our latest album, and love this song, love the message. It's called Steel.
hadn't he always been faithful? My, my, my. Great is thy faithfulness. I'm so thankful. Boy, hadn't this music been wonderful? Man, I'm telling, we're spoiled on music. We could do with some preaching, but we got good music anyway. Y'all all right tonight? If you love the Lord, say amen. amen. I figure you do. You wouldn't be here on a Wednesday night in the middle of the week, but I'm glad to see each and every one of you here. If you got your Bibles, uh, let's turn. We've been preaching on Noah, and we were in Matthew 24, and then we're in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, and then we're in 1 Peter 3, verse 20. And uh, tonight, let's just turn to... Uh, you turn anywhere, it's all good, amen? Let's go to, let's, why not go to where his story is? Let's go to Genesis chapter 7, how about that? Let's go there for tonight. Somebody said, you've been preaching on Noah and hadn't even got in the book of Genesis yet, so we might as well go there and look at, look at this a little bit. And uh, my goodness, I have enjoyed being here. I want to say thank you so much for letting us come and preach and uh, I'm just honored, and to be with the Morrisons, man, we, we love them dearly. We thank God for them, and uh, just enjoy. They're, they're some of my very favorite singers that there are out there, and uh, they believe what they sing, and they live it, and it blesses my soul. You found Genesis 7, say amen. amen. Let's stand together in honor of the reading of the Word of God. If you're physically able, that baby has not fell asleep in your lap yet. Genesis chapter 7, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female, of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth for yet seven days. Now you remember in Genesis 6, God said, I'm going to give you about a hundred years. Now he's saying seven days. Seven days and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean, of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth, there went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. We'll stop reading right there. You may be seated. If you look in Genesis 6, you see the setting that brings us to this and we see that sin is growing in the world. Chapter 6 uh, verse 1 talks about how they, man began to multiply and, and sin became, uh, uh, it was growing exponentially. Sin and wickedness was spreading everywhere. Then if you look at verses 2 down to about verse 4, you'll see that sin is gross. It gets worse. Sin never gets better. It always gets worse. And the devil will feed you a lie. He'll say just this little bit and that'll be enough. You'll be satisfied and you'll be all right. But I got news for you. Sin is always downward spiral and it always gets worse and makes things worse. The, the old songwriter said sin will take you further than you plan to go. Keep you longer than you plan to stay and cost you more than you plan to pay. Sin got very gross and so much so that 
a God was disturbed deeply. Then we saw in verse 5 through 7 that sin is grisly. What do you mean by that? Well, God said because of this in verse 7 of chapter 6, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. In other words, it has gotten so grisly that God said that we'd be better off to wipe this thing clean, kill everybody, and be done with it. And I'm going to tell you that that ought to be no surprise to anybody who's familiar with the Word of God because the wages of sin is death, always has been, always will be. And I'm going to tell you the wages of sin is death and the wages have never been reduced. God said it in the garden before there even was sin. He said the day you eat of that, thou shalt surely die. Sin is grisly. It always brings, it destroys. That's what it does, it brings death. It'll kill relationships. It kills marriages. It kills father-son relationships. It kills uh, everything that it can touch. Sin brings death. And we saw that sin became grisly. But then we saw in verse number 8 that sin has grace. God gives grace Where there is sin, the Bible said, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I I, I preach a message, I I, I won't preach it tonight, but sometimes preachers, they start talking about one message, you end up preaching five messages, I'll try not to preach it tonight, but I do preach a message on what's grace doing there. Because this is the law. We're under the Old Testament here. This is not the New Testament where we're in the age of grace or the day of grace. But we're in that Old Testament. But I'm going to tell you something. God's salvation has always been by grace through faith. And grace is found there. You realize that to most people, Noah probably seemed like a crazy, obsessed old man. He's building an ark in his backyard. He's building an ark. He's dedicated his whole life to building this ark. He raises his kids building an ark. And and, and I guarantee you, people say, what are you doing? He said, well, there's going to be a flood. A flood? What's a flood? Never heard of a flood before. Well, it's going to do this thing called rain. Rain? What's rain? Never heard of rain before. Well, I'm just telling you, God said it's going to rain. There's going to be a flood. And the only people that are going to survive are going to be on that big wood box in my backyard. I mean, we got some folks about that crazy. Now they dig a hole in the ground, think they're going to survive the apocalypse by living in a hole in the ground. There might be some of y'all here tonight. If you are, when things get bad, I'm going to come knocking. And I hope you got enough MREs for the both of us. And I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm pretty well used to about a 2,800 calorie diet every day. So make sure you got enough MREs for both of us, all right? The doctor said 2,000. But I said, I'm still hungry when that's over with. Yeah, yeah. I've, uh, I, 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 somebody said, are you on a diet? So, well, actually, I'm on three because I couldn't get enough to eat on the first two. <laughs> huh? Then he said, we're going we're gonna to live in that, we're going to survive by getting in that big wood box I'm building. And the only way to survive the judgment of God is to go through that door and get in that, in that box with me. Can you imagine? He must have seemed like a crazy, obsessed old man. But... Those people did have one clue that they should have listened to the crazy, obsessed old man. They did have one clue. You know what that clue was? The animals. The animals. They had a pretty good clue that they probably ought to get in that box. The animals. Tonight I want to preach God being my helper just a little while. Now on on Monday night we preached on Noah's day out of Matthew 24 where he said they knew not till the flood came. And we we preached on what you don't know can hurt you. Then then, then Tuesday morning we preached to a room full of preachers and, and we preached on this thought, Noah's life. And we looked at the fact that Noah was a preacher man. Preaching righteousness. Preaching the judgment of God. 
Then, then last night we preached on Noah's time. Over in Peter, First Peter chapter three and verse twenty or chapter two, and we saw we saw where the Bible said that that while Noah was a preparing the ark, God waited. Tonight I want to preach. God be my helper on this thought. Noah's witnesses. Noah's witnesses. For a hundred years, Noah's been building that big box in the backyard. He's been down at the hardware store buying this. Some lady told me that night. She said, uh, preacher, she said, I learned something today. She said, I didn't even know they had hardware stores when Noah was around. I said, well, isn't that great? The one thing you remember wasn't even scriptural, amen. <laughs> That's how preaching works, Amen. Noah's going down there and getting the nails and he's, he's going down to the lumber yard and trying to get all the gopher wood he can get and, and he's bought up all the pitch in the area and waiting for another order from Home Desperate. I, 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 when you get another pallet of that pitch, you let me know. I got to get all I can get. We got, we building a box in the backyard. They say, what are you doing that for? Because judgment is coming and God has made a way of salvation and there's only one way. You got to get in that box. I guarantee you they thought he was crazy. But then one day, one of them old gals is, washing dishes and looks out her kitchen window and says, Honey! He says, Yes. She says, You know you know how crazy Noah is? He said, Yeah. She said, You know how he said he's a building that big old box to save the world and, and that they're going to get all the animals on it? Yeah. I know how he's crazy. Yeah, he's crazy. He said, Honey, you need to come here and look because there's two rhinoceroses coming down the road <laughs> and they're headed to Noah's house. Y'all with me so far? Maybe she said, hey, and, and if that isn't odd enough, honey, here comes two triceratops. <laughs> two giraffes. Two monkeys. Here comes seven little lambs running down the road. And they're headed to Noah's house. I got to be honest with y'all. I don't know about y'all, but I got a feeling I'd be scratching my head and second guessing myself whenever I saw that. And two little old dogs. I, you know, it's no problem getting dogs to load up. Somebody say, hey, man, you got, you get your little, I'm sure he had two blue tick uh, uh, hound dogs, and he said, load up, boys, and they ran in. But when he got them two cats to go on there, you knew he was doing something. Hello, cats, you don't tell cats what to do. They tell you what to do. They load it up first time. I think somebody said, hey, maybe Noah was right. Maybe Noah's right. Maybe we ought to get, oh, honey, he's crazy. Yeah, he might be crazy, but I'll tell you right now, the cows don't think he's crazy. Hey, listen, the monkeys don't think he's crazy. They're loading up on the boat. Noah had witnesses to everything he was preaching. They bore witness to the truth of his message of the coming judgment of God. Can I tell you this? All of nature sings God's praises. The heavens declare the glory of God. I'm here to tell you, if they had held their shout on a Palm Sunday, the rocks would have cried out. What are you saying, Brother Jason? I'm telling you right now, nature thinks man has lost its mind because we want to ignore God, pretend He doesn't exist, when all of nature knows who God is. It is unnatural not to know who God is. It goes against nature to deny God. He said in Romans chapter 1 that all creation is enough evidence to put us all in hell. And there's enough that we would be without excuse. You see... I want to talk about Noah's witnesses tonight. The first thing I want us to notice is if you look at chapter 7, verse number 9, the Bible says there went in two and two. Unto Noah, into the ark, the male and the female as God had commanded Noah. Can I say these animals had more sense than most heathen? That's my first big point. These animals had more sense than most heathen. 
The heathen's outside mocking God. The heathen's outside rejecting the message. The heathen's outside mocking the man of God. But the animals are getting on the boat. They had more sense than most heathen. Can I tell you something? The message of judgment has not changed. God's judgment is coming. I'm here to tell you there's a judgment day that is on the horizon. And just to be honest with you, all of nature knows it. You can tell it by the world and what's going on around us. It is very clear that everything is lining up just exactly like God's word said it would. Just like it did in Genesis when Noah priest and priest and People thought he was crazy. But one day everything started lining up. And oh my, I'm going to tell you, things are lining up. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Just take your newspaper and open it up. You can read an article in the paper and find it in your Bible. Everything's lining up. These animals had more sense than most heathen. My dad had a great uncle, Edgar Quarles. And Edgar lived in Calhoun, Georgia. He lived right outside Calhoun. He had uh, several massive farms. And uh, when I was young growing up, uh, my dad pastored little bitty churches, little country churches. And so we painted houses in the warm weather to help make ends meet. And we cut firewood in the cold weather to help make ends meet. And my Uncle Edgar had given my dad permission to come down on one of his farms down in Calhoun. And he said, you can come down here anytime, son, and cut all the wood you want to cut. And so my dad would load us four boys in that old square body Chevrolet pickup truck. And we'd go down in the woods and we'd spend all day down there cutting wood. I, I loved it. Hard work, but I loved it. I loved it for a couple of reasons. When my dad said, the boys, we're going to go cut firewood tomorrow, I knew that meant on the way out, when it was still dark outside, dad was going to pull into the pump and go, and we was going to get a big old chocolate milk and a honey bun on the way out. Dad thought a man ought to have a little bit of calories in him if he's going to be cutting wood. I felt like a man. I was just a young kid. I felt like a man. My dad would crank that chainsaw. He'd run that saw all day. We'd load the bed of that truck three or four times in a day and carry it in and out. But every now and then, uh, my dad would, he'd set that saw down. Uh, he'd turn it off and set it down. Uh, he'd have us all get something to drink, uh, a little bit of water to keep us hydrated. And he'd give us a little rest and he'd teach us things. My, my dad taught us that, that, we, that young boys ought to grow up to be men. Isn't that a weird concept? He taught us that young girls ought to grow up to be ladies. I know that's bizarre. So strange. And, and, and he taught us that if you was a real man, he said every real man had a five-gallon bucket. And in that five-gallon bucket, every real man had a few main essentials in life. My dad taught us everybody ought to have a pocket knife. He taught us that if, if somebody asked you if you had a pocket knife, your response was to be, I've got my pants on, don't I? He said, everybody, every man ought to have a five-gallon bucket. You never know when you're going to need a five-gallon bucket. He said, it makes for a good seat if you need to sit down for a little while. He said, you can fill it up with dirt, water, rocks, concrete. You can fill it up with anything when you need it. And he said, but in that five-gallon bucket, every man ought to have a few things. Every man ought to have a length of rope. My dad believed every man ought to have rope. Never know when you're going to need a piece of rope. And my dad believed a man ought to have a roll of duct tape and a can of WD-40. He said, if it's, if it's loose and won't stay still, you duct tape it. And if it's stuck and won't come loose, you WD-40 it. And my dad taught us things like that. And i never forget one time he set a, the chainsaw down and we were sitting around just drinking a little bit of water and just talking softly. Dad said, boys, notice how quiet it is out here. He said, just be quiet for a minute. I think he said that for my brother Jonathan. He didn't know how to be. I, not me, Jonathan. And we was listening. And Dad said, you know, it's too quiet. I said, what's too quiet, Dad? He said, well, he said, normally these woods would be filled with the sounds of animals. He said, but because we're here running this chainsaw and running our mouths, he said, it, the animals have fled and it's quiet. 
One day we were out in the woods and we'd been on one of those breaks for a little while and all of a sudden a fox ran up over the hill, looked at us, ran right through us and kept going. My dad said, boys, it's time to go. We said, why is that? Are we done? He said, well, we're not done. He said, but when the animals run towards you and they're not afraid of you, it's time for you to go because there's something back there that they're more afraid of than they are of you. And my dad taught us that if the animals run towards you and run past you, he taught us this, follow the animals. Y'all with me? Now y'all can tell by looking at me that I do not do a lot of running. <laughs> Running's just not in my vocabulary. If you see me running, you better be running. Because if you see me running, you better know there's something bigger than me and meaner than me behind me. Follow the animals. These animals had more sense than most heathen. They, they, they didn't have the heathen didn't have enough sense to see for seven days animals. You don't load a bunch of animals overnight. Somebody say amen. You ever packed up? For a long stay, you don't pack up overnight. It takes a while. These animals were coming for seven days straight. Animals were just nonstop coming and loading on the ark. And yet not one other person besides Noah and his family thought that they might ought to follow the animals. I wish my dad had taught them what he taught me. It's time to get on the ark. It's going to get bad. You see, the animals had more sense than most heathen. Because they were following God. Number two, I notice the Bible says that they went, look at verse 7 again, chapter 7, verse 9 again. They went two and two unto Noah into the ark. Can I say this? I notice these animals not only had more sense than most heathen, but these animals are more sensitive than most Christians. Because, because they went, they obeyed God in a timely manner and they went to the man of God and they went into God's plan for their life. You, 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 didn't, you didn't hear the two monkeys out in the front discussing whether or not they should get on there. There's no arguments happening. There's no discussion. There's nobody going, well, we're going to pray about it. No, they got on the ark. They went unto Noah, into the ark. They were, listen, they were more sensitive than most Christians. You know, the Bible tells us that God tries the reins. He says, I try the reins. God wants to know how sensitive we are. I grew up with horses. I told you all that before. We had land and uh, fenced in areas and we had horses and ponies. And uh, Dad used us uh, uh, to break in horses for other people. They would bring horses and we would saddle break them and rain break them. It was, it was a fun childhood. Lots of bruises, broken things. It was great. <laughs> and uh, we, had, we, had a, we, had a, we had a pony named Buddy. Pony, he was a Shetland pony. But he thought he was the great stallion. And little Buddy was really a pulling pony. He was made for pulling those little two-wheel carts. And uh, he was, he was, he was uh, rain trained, so you'd sit on him. And, and if you right, wanted to go right, you grabbed the right rein with all your might and you pulled to the right and that bit would get him and he would go to the right. You grab that left rein, pull to the left, he'd go to the left. Now he was a pulling pony, so he was trained to pull. And so he, you could G and haw him. If anybody knows, can bear witness with that. You could, my dad even took us boys to Mr. Johnson's farm and we actually hooked up to a plow and my dad had all of us boys take that pony and plow a field because dad thought you could never really be a man until you'd walk behind a plow. And old buddy was, he was, he thought he was a great stallion but he was also ornery. You had to make him obey. I mean, you had to make him obey. But we also had an Arabian gated horse named Gray Boy. The 16 hands tall, beautiful 
and, and, and wonderfully trained. He could do every gate. He could do gates we didn't know about. When our furrier would come to shoe the horses and, and to frog them and do all that work, when he would come, he would beg my dad, please, could I, could I put Gray Boy through his paces? We knew how to rack and canter, but that was about it besides a gallop. We didn't know anything about walking horses. <laughs> we were little boys. But he would come and get on Gray Boy, and Gray Boy was neck reined. He was very sensitive. If the rain touched his neck on this side, he'd automatically start going that way. If it touched his neck on this side, he'd start going that way. He could, he could uh, do these amazing fox trots and these other things. I would, I would watch our furrier would get on him to ride him, and he could do this thing where it looked like he was going somewhere, but he wasn't even moving. Just, oh, it was amazing. And then he'd do the same with the horse would back up. And then he would turn around and back up some more. I mean, that horse was amazing. Sensitive to the rain. Sensitive. I mean, if you just laid on. And my best friend, Howard McCracken, his mom and dad were pig farmers. And, and, and Howard had a horse. And he, his horse was a, it was an ornery horse. Uh, it, uh, it was a quarter horse, but it wasn't very well trained. You wouldn't, hardly couldn't even get him to come to get a saddle on him. And Howard loved riding, though. We loved riding with Howard. One day, Howard asked my dad. He begged my dad to ride Gray Boy, and dad said, okay. And he gets up on Gray Boy's back, and dad says, go ride in that cornfield across the road. Our road was a big old gravel road, but... but but the way those fields were there in Tennessee, we had deep ditches between the road and the house, big deep ditches. And, and, and the cornfield actually sat about four feet higher than the road. Like this, a little bit higher than this. And then there was a deep ditch and then there was the road. And I never forget Howard was riding. And, and that now when you rode Buddy, it was like this. You needed a back adjustment when you got done. But when you rode Gray Boy, Gray Boy, you moved like this in the saddle. It was just, oh, it's so awesome. And Howard was having a time riding Gray Boy. But what Howard didn't realize was that rain was touching the neck of that horse. And that he has that horse in a full stride. He's not in a gallop, but he's in a full stride. And with every step, that horse is taking a half an inch closer and closer to that ditch. And Howard was absolutely clueless that he was guiding that horse into that ditch. And my dad was standing on the other side of the road. And I saw my dad's eyes get that big. And he said, I was afraid to yell that I would scare Howard into a sudden movement. But I didn't know what to say because you're looking at a $35,000 horse about to plunge into the ditch. Because that horse was so sensitive and so obedient that he would go into that ditch to obey that rain. And I'll never forget it. I didn't know exactly what was going on. But I saw the fear and the blood drain on my dad's head. And I looked over and I saw Gray Boy getting closer and closer. And you ain't going to believe what happened. When Gray Boy got right to the edge. And I'm talking about the dirt was falling out from underneath his hoof. He just leapt into the air. And landed on the road and never missed. And Howard went. Because he had no idea. That he was guiding that horse to do it. My dad didn't know he would jump. I didn't know he would jump. Howard certainly didn't know he would jump. And child of God, that's how we ought to be. We ought not have to have somebody get a grip on us and pull us one way. God ought, shouldn't have to get a hold on us and jerk us the other way. Boy, just the still small voice of the master in our ear, just the whisperings of the word of God in the wee hours of the morning ought to guide our hearts. He whispered in the ears of the animals, it's time to go, it's time to load. And they went into the ark. You see, those animals had more sense than most heathen, and they are more sensitive than most Christians. Proverbs 13, 20 says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. I love this verse. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Do you find that interesting? You would think that the way that proverb is going, you would think that it would say, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, and he that walketh a companion of fools will be a fool, but it doesn't say that. It says a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Because you may not actually be a fool, 
But if you listen to the wrong crowd and hang out with the wrong crowd and mess around with the wrong crowd, you may die a fool's death with the fool. The animals were more sensitive than most Christians. They got on. They got in the will of God. They went to the man of God under Noah and they got into God's plan into the ark. And then we obviously can see not only were these animals more, have more sense than most heathen, not are they, only are they more sensitive than most Christians, but these animals are more safe than most people. They were safe. They got on that ark. They didn't know anything about ark construction. The animals weren't like, well, I don't know. How well built is this ark? Uh, No, exactly what experience did you have with boat building before you started building this ark? No. They got in God's will. They trusted God's will and they were safe. And other than the other eight people who got on with them, all of humanity died in the judgment of God. You see, they were more safe than most people. We can see that in chapter 7, verse number 10. The Bible says it came to pass. After seven days, the floods, waters of the flood were upon the earth. Look at verse number 16. And when they went in, went in male and female. of all men, God's amazing. And he said in a male and a female. He might have known something. Well, he might have known what he was doing. I'm not going to park it there. But I want to. Male and female of all flesh. As God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth. And the waters increased and bare up the ark. And it was lift up above the earth. And the waters prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Look at verse 21. And all flesh died. They were more saved. Than most people. Conclusion, I just want to say this. And not only did these animals show more sense than the average person by being saved from the wrath to come, but they can also teach us some lessons on seeing other people saved from the judgment of God. Two lessons I draw from these animals that I hope you'll take home with you tonight. The first one is this. They each brought somebody else with them none of them went alone they each brought somebody with them no animal went on that boat alone are you taking somebody with you or are you one of these people who say well I'm saved and I'm satisfied and I'll just float in church and float out I'm not worried about telling other people or reaching other people or bringing no none of them went alone they, every one of them brought somebody with them. Man, we ought to have a desire to bring somebody with us. I, I would challenge you to look beyond your own family. Bring your family with you, yes. But, but listen, don't be satisfied to say, just me and my four and no more. No, we ought to have a desire to bring somebody with us. The second thing I noticed that we learn about bringing others with us is not only did they bring somebody with them, but the clean ones brought more than the unclean. You saw it in your Bible right there. There were seven of the clean and only two of the unclean. I would tell you tonight, if you're interested in bringing somebody with you, you might ought to want to get on an altar and say, Okay, God, I'm interested in bringing as many as I can bring with me and I recognize that I need to be clean. I need to have a good testimony. I need to walk right and holy. I need you to clean me inside and out. And then, Lord, I need to get dedicated to living a clean life so that others might see what I have and want to go with me you see none of them went alone and the clean ones brought more with them clean living has a great value and clean living has great vision when God tells you to go get somebody you ought to do the work and trust God to draw them you see what happened here God told Noah bring on the animals How many of you realize real quickly that's an impossible work for Noah to do? So you know what I believe Noah did? I believe he brought the ones he could bring and trusted God to bring the rest. 
Easy to load the dogs, not so easy with the cats. Y'all ever try to herd kittens? It's just not easy. Might have not been too hard to get a couple of cattle on the ark. Might not have even been hard to get a couple of camels. But I promise you the T-Rexes were not as easy to get on the boat. You know what he did? He reached all that he could reach and God did the rest. We do well tonight to pay attention to Noah's witnesses. Number one, if you're here tonight and you've never been saved, can I tell you? The signs are all around you. It's as evident as the animals getting on the ark that God's judgment is coming. It's as evident as the animals getting on the ark that the word of God is true. It's as evident as the animals getting on the ark that there is one way of salvation and that's through Jesus Christ our Lord. He said neither is there salvation in any other for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. There is one way. You do not have to go to hell. Let me tell you what to do to go to hell. You want, you want to go to hell? Let me tell you what to do. Nothing. Don't do a thing. You're on your way. But I'm going to tell you something. God knows that. He knew that. And He loved every human so much. He didn't want you to go. And so He made a way for you to go to heaven. I heard people say, I can't believe God sends people to hell. They don't. God doesn't send people to hell. They're already going. God sent His Son so you don't have to go to hell. The animals have enough sense to come to God. Do you? And then you say, well, preacher, I'm as saved as I'm going to be. Well, I'm glad you're saved, but I hope you're not satisfied to get on by yourself. Let's all have a burden. We can get some musicians and everyone to stand. I just want to ask you a question tonight. Can you think of one person that you want to see to go to heaven with you? Can you put in your mind's eye one person you're burdened for? Maybe more than one, but one. Just one that you'd say, Preacher, I want to do everything I can to see that one go. And I certainly don't want my life to do anything to turn them away from coming to Jesus. I wonder if there's anybody in here tonight that would say, Preacher, I'm burdened enough for that person to come to an altar and call their name out to God one more time. Maybe it's a prodigal that you've got. Our churches are filled with prodigals that grew up in our Sunday school classes and grew up in our junior churches, but now where are they? Who's got a burden for them tonight? I wonder if anybody would come while she softly plays. I wonder if anybody would come and just say, I'm going to pray for that one name. Maybe you've got five names. I don't know how burdened you are for others, but I know this, I wouldn't want to go and not have even cared enough to do my best to get someone to go with me. Maybe it, maybe you've been trying to reach others, but you realize there's some things in your life that might be keeping people from listening to your testimony. And you realize, I, I, I want to be as clean as I can be. I don't want anything between my soul and the Savior Keep the way clear. Let nothing between. Maybe you just want to come and say, Lord, I need to get some things right so I can be a better testimony at work, a better witness with my family. If I clean the lens, maybe they will more clearly see Jesus in me. While these are here, kneeling and praying and doing business with God, if you're here tonight and you do not know Jesus as your Savior, wouldn't you come? Just come. Somebody will gladly meet you here. If you don't know what to do, if you'll get here and raise your hand, somebody will bring a Bible and show you how you can know for sure tonight that your sins were washed away and you have a sweet relationship with Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. There's still people praying tonight. <clears throat> you pray. Just praying for some people that are special to me. God, speak to their heart. God, protect them. 
until they come to the ark of safety. God, wherever they are right now, show them, show them that they need you. You know, a person doesn't go to the doctor until they realize they're sick. That's why Jesus said, the well have no need of a physician. You can't get saved till you get lost. You, you, you can't be born again until you realize you're dead in trespasses and sins. And when you realize that your sin separates you from a holy God, that sin condemns us to a devil's hell, then, friend, you could see the life in Christ that came out of that tomb that Easter morning. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Doesn't matter how good we are, doesn't matter. Listen, I've known some people in this world, as far as people go, I would say they were good, they work hard, they, they take care of their family, they do the things that are right, they don't break the laws. They're, we would say that's a good woman, that's a good man. But you know what Jesus said? There's none good, no, not one. Because we're not comparing ourselves to other men and women. But we compare ourselves to God. The Bible says that we all fall short of the glory of God. So friend, if you've never trusted Christ as your personal Savior, say, preach, why do I need to be saved? That word saved gets thrown around. You Baptists like that saved and born again stuff. Well, it's Bible words and and if you're in a lake drowning and somebody comes and gives you a, a rope, what what they call it? They got saved. They saved you. Well, can I tell you, Christ loves you so much he came and he provided the rope. He provided the life preserver. And it's him, his life for yours. And when we trust Christ as our Savior, that's what we're doing. We're saying, I acknowledge I'm the sinner, I acknowledge he's the Savior, and I'm trusting him to save me. You know, there's a lot of people in this world that they trust their, their baptism. Well, I got baptized one time. I said a prayer one time. I, I was a good person. I went to church. I did this. I went to this class. I, I go to confession every now and again. I, I rub some beads. I light some candles. I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a pretty good girl. Friend, listen to me. There's no work that you could ever do that would forgive one sin. The only work that God accepts is the work that Christ did on the cross of Calvary. See, Christ did all the work. If, if we could work our way there, then why would he have to die? But Christ did all the work. So, so when we get saved, what we're doing is we're saying, I trust that Christ is my Savior. Christ is good enough. I'm not good enough. Christ is righteous, I'm not righteous. Christ is holy, I'm not holy. And what we're saying is we say, I'm a sinner and I'm trusting him to be my savior. That's it, that's it. I trust you to be, our faith for eternal life gets put into him, that's it. You say, preacher, you going to heaven? Absolutely, I know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. I'm saved forever, why, why do you think that? The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I trust Christ to be my savior, I'm trusting him. Friend, you listen to me. If I go to hell, I'm going to hell trusting Christ. If I, would, if I could die and go to hell, I would go through the blood of Jesus Christ because that's all that my hope is in tonight. Only the work of Christ. And there's no one, you listen to me, there's no one who's ever trusted in Christ who has ever failed. <laughs> there's no one that trust, trusted in Christ who has ever died and went to hell. Oh, friend, would you, would you tonight, my heart's heavy, maybe... Maybe you're hearing you say, Preacher, I've never trusted in Christ. I've, I've trusted in a baptism. I've trusted in a, a prayer that I prayed one time. Listen, friend, salvation will bring a change in your life. New life brings new life. We're going to just play just a moment. If God has spoke to your heart, say, Preacher, I'd like to be saved. I'd like to know for sure. If you want to be saved, you, you want to come to this altar, you just saw a whole bunch of people coming up here and praying, and they was just talking to the Lord about some things, some Christians talking, but nobody's looking around, I'm not going to embarrass you, you say, preacher, I don't know if I'm saved, I don't know that I am, or maybe you say, preacher, I know, I know I'm not, but I know I need to be, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, 
I've never got on that ark. I've never trusted Christ. If you'd like to, if you come to this altar, friend, I'll, I'll get somebody to take a Bible and show you from God's word, not my word, not the Baptist word, not Victory Baptist word, but from God's word, how you know you can be saved. If you'd like to be saved, friend, you can do that right now. We'd be glad to help you. Listen, and I, I speak for everybody. That I'm talking about Victory Baptist Church now, our home crowd. Hey, if you want to get saved, we would, we would be elated. We would joy with you, wouldn't we, church? Amen? We would joy with you. We'd love to see people trust Christ as their Savior. As we wait just a moment, God speak into your heart. Friend, you come. You come. You say, preacher, I can't go up there. I can't go up there. Well, listen, would you come see me before you leave this building? If you have any doubt in your heart, please don't leave the building without trusting Christ as your Savior. Lord, I love you tonight. And Lord, I give you praise for this time that you've given to us. Thank you for the message of the ark. <laughs> Lord, what a, what a wonderful promise we have. God, I thank you, Lord, for the witness of the animals tonight. God, I thank you. Lord, that you always have a witness for your word. God, we're your witnesses. Help us to be found faithful. But help us not to be stubborn, Lord. Help us to be good witnesses and to do the work that you want us to do. And Lord, as we leave here tonight, God, I pray that we would, uh, Lord, spend some time tonight, spend some time tomorrow praying and uh, let this message sink in and asking you how we can change our lives to be more like you and less like the world. Father, I pray that you keep folks safe as they travel home. God, I pray you give them a, a good night's rest. God, let them, let them get rest like it's 12 hours sleep. I mean, let them get a good sleep. Lord, Lord, let their hearts and their bodies and minds be rested. And Lord, I pray that you bring us back tomorrow night. Lord, as we leave and take up the offering, bless the offering and multiply it to meet the needs of, of these uh, evangelists. Lord, we ask that your, uh, that your word would keep going forth in their ministries. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm glad of that. Boy, I was thinking while the preacher was preaching, I said, man, I don't want no monkey being smarter than me. Amen. Huh? <laughs> I, I, I don't want no gorilla. I don't want no, I, I don't, you know, some dog. Bless God. I didn't mention cats. I don't want some cat smarter than me. Amen. Now, come on now. I don't want them animals to get smarter than me. I want, I want to obey. I want to do. That's good. Amen. Well, I like that. I love preaching, man. That's just like, it's like a big old well. You just keep getting water out of it, water out of it. You read something a thousand times and just don't see something until the man of God brings it out. I love it. Thank you, preacher, for coming this way, and, and uh, we appreciate you. Uh, tonight, when we get ready to leave, tonight, stop by the, uh, the table, the Morrisons out there. Uh, they have some, uh, some things on the table uh, that they've made. Uh, some of you young ladies want some little dangly things or whatever they had. Now, not you guys. I didn't say no guys go over there. I don't, we don't, no, no sales to men. No, uh, listen, but, but you, uh, uh, I saw Brother Dean out there checking them out the other, I don't know. I, I, I guess he's got them from his Pam. I don't, I don't know. I'm not judging. I'm not judging. But, uh, <laughs> but anyhow, uh, stop by, get some of that, and some good music. There's some good gospel music out there. And listen, we've got tomorrow night and Friday night, just clear off the calendar and say, you know what, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that God speak to my heart. I'm going to be in my place right here, and I'm going I'm to you know, just get what God wants me to do so I can shine for Christ in, in my neighborhood and in my job. Christians, we got to shine. This world's dark. Man, it's dark. we got to keep shining, all right? Let's be in here tomorrow. I'm praying for you. God bless you. You're dismissed. God bless. Amen.